so much, Michael Sean, for joining me today at the Montreal International Film Festival. Uh, I have a few questions in regards to uh, all things that you do within uh, being a VFX artist. Um, and I want to just talk a bit about what you have done, like way back in the past, or how you ended up getting into uh, the industry. If you can recollect whatever that's happened um, from way back when, I would love to hear all about it. Well, I can, I can remember in high school being very interested in photography, uh, going through mm -hmm. magazines. I know Life, Life magazine was, was pretty big on my hit list of just kind of perusing, going through um, magazines, ads. Um, I was really struck by the fact that, you know, in every magazine there was, a, there was an ad and there was a photographer that, that had done this. Um, my mom was very uh, instrumental in trying to focus us kids into getting a career and we had, you know, by her suggestion is like find three things that you want to do and, you know, first thing being the best and second being a fallback and the third is your fall fallback. And so mine was engineering, culinary school and photography and I, I got into engineering and just didn't didn't enjoy where where I was going with it. Uh, the culinary school was kind of a non-starter at that point because I didn't have any resources at my disposal. So photography became my my fallback last last ditch effort. Um, studied studied at a vocational technical school. Uh, got a portfolio together and applied to I don't know six or seven major art schools around the country and got accepted to Art Center College of Design. Um, that started my career as far as like getting into the industry or into the photography industry. Uh, mm -hmm. Graduated from there in 1989 and started, you know, working. As soon as I, as soon as I left, I had, had clients, um, national ads, local ads, and started working. Um, I joined into a partnership with a, an a instructor of mine from Art Center, mm -hmm. and he shot people and I shot products and we were kind of a team. From there, I started doing, exploring lighting, different types of lighting and how to create moods, much more illustrative photography than just straight up photography. Um, and that kind of led me down to the path of like hiring myself out to other photographers and as a DP or just kind of an onset lighting person. Um, yeah, that's, that's where I started from photography. So you have been a CG supervisor for a whole bunch of films. And I just want to just, I, I'm going to ramble off a, a few of them. We have okay. um, uh, The Last Stand, Many uh -huh. Black Three, Yep. And a personal favorite of mine, which is the final destination. Absolutely <laughs> love that. Right. And, right. And um, and Godzilla as well. Godzilla. Well, Godzilla. Okay. Funny thing, Godzilla. Well, it, okay. First things first. You totally missed the uh, the Academy Award winners like Master and Commander and Argo. But you know, we'll <laughs> go with Godzilla because it was <laughs> but. Godzilla was was really fun because it was the transition from photography into CG. Um, mm -hmm. I had no, I had very very little experience uh, when jumping on to Godzilla with computers. Um, so my wife my wife landed the gig with Centropolis. Um, I think she might have been the seventh person person hired, and she was the texturing supervisor was going to paint Godzilla. Um, at the time. Patrick, Patrick Totopoulos, who was the, the designer of Godzilla, was in the process of building building the maquettes. Um, we got authorization to go down and photograph the process. So there would be a, a leg of Godzilla sculpted to a six foot high man. Mm. Um, we'd put it on a turntable and I would flatly light it and take pictures of it as on a turntable. and. I would take those pictures back to Centropolis, 
uh, well, have them processed, and then I would scan them because we didn't have digital cameras. And then I would help lay out for the texturing process. Um, when Fast forward, when we finished texturing, uh, they were looking for lighters. They were starting to build the whole crew, and they asked if knew that I was a photographer and asked if I wanted to help out with lighting. I had a little bit of trepidation because I didn't I didn't know anything about the software package and I didn't know how CG lighting worked. It mm -hmm. was it was a shocker to me that you know in my mind for years and years for 15 20 years working in in just well being around light and photographing light um, to have it light end at one pixel past where I say it ends that was that was a mind that blew my mind. So I worked really hard to figure out how I could teach myself how CG lighting works. And, you know, again, it might sound simple for, for your viewers or your, your people who are going to watch this, but coming from photography where there's always bounce light, there's always, you know, some sense of light, no matter what, um, you know, CG lighting became a, a hard thing for me to understand. But, um, yeah, so I just worked through that. You've been in the industry for uh, almost 30 years plus. Yes. Yeah. And I wanted to talk about some of the obstacles that you have uh, dealt with. Could you tell our viewers, our uh, youth that are trying to get into the industry, tell, could you speak about some of the things that you've dealt with that you've been like, oh my God, I'm not even sure how I could have gone past this. And what were some of the solutions that you had um, cre found to, to overcome these? I think, I think one of the hardest things for me was the, the collaboration. Uh, coming from uh, the photography, it was just me and an art director. Sometimes it was just me creating something and then I'd sell it to uh, the magazines or illustrators or, uh, not illustrators, I'm sorry, art directors. Mm -hmm. But coming into this and working with multiple people doing multiple things and, and we're all trying to focus our energy into this outcome. Um, for me, I've always wanted to do it myself. So trying to open up has been kind of, uh, it's been a struggle. It's been a, it's been a journey, I say. Mm -hmm. um, that's when I was a lighting artist. Now that the visual effects, you know, doing the visual effects supervising is, it's even more so important to kind of focus everybody's attention, all the team members' attention to what we're trying to do, but still give them the opportunity to add and plus, you know, in their speciality. So that's been a that's been an ongoing process. And you know, there's certain times that you'll have a, a direct line or a focus to exactly what you want, and then there's times you you can open it up to your artists and go, you know. We're thinking about somewhere in this range, what do you have to offer to this? You know, wh how do you see we get to this point? So that's, that's been uh, an ongoing and a project to project um, process. And I'm glad that you yeah. spoke on that because I feel that um, a lot of people forget about that element when it comes to wanting to get into the industry or or wanting to have the, their dream job, they forget about what the um, the workplace environment is like and right. dealing with a lot of um, different type of people. And that industry in particular is that has a lot of creatives and a lot of people are very, um, they're very passionate about what they do and they have uh, something envisaged in their mind that they want to create. So it must be quite difficult being in a room with people like this. It, it, it is. You're also forgetting that you have the creative people, but you also have the technical people that, that mm -hmm. are very, just as passionate about their technology that as an artist is about their visuals. So there you get all of this, these people in, in a room. It, it's quite, quite, quite an eclectic mix of, of personalities. So, and, it's, it's dealing with that that I find kind of fun. Um, I kind of liken it to everything that we do in this industry or, or f for the final goal of the movie 
is we solve problems. You know, here's here's the problem. We need to get this this guy from point A to point B. How do we do it? We need to, you know, use your final destination reference. You know, how how do we make this lady's throat open up by a bolt that goes through it. I mean, and what does that look like? I mean, how, how much of the skin flaps around and how do we do it? And, and what looks right? I had to throw that in there for you. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I thank you for it. <laughs> now, um, it might be a silly question, but do you have to have a creative eye to supervise VFX? I, yeah, totally. Uh, I think that's, one that is the most important thing uh, you're bringing yes yes you're bringing all of these different disciplines into focus and at a certain point and and trying to to tell that one story point as quickly as as possible and to the best of your ability uh yes you definitely have to have a creative eye for this in regards to youth getting into the industry um what is one piece of advice that you could give them uh, i guess it would be always don't look don't miss the opportunity to do other things um i started out in photography and i'm ended up in, in visual effects you know making vi huge movies um mm -hmm. It's not where I started. It's not where I thought I would start or end rather. Um, yeah. Everything has been uh, jumping from one one different problem solving thing to another unique problem solving thing to another. I mean, currently I'm a visual effects supervisor for Walt Disney's Imagineering. I make the illusions for the attractions around the world. So I never never would have i didn't even know what an imagineer was um and now it's like i'm traveling around the world creating these illusions for the parks so wow. it's it's just never give up and always mm -hmm. take the opportunity to do something new and unique that's what i would say uh, one more question um sure. in regards to technology uh i know that technology changes so regularly in so many different industries could you talk a little bit about how technology has changed um current like from the the last 30 years that you've been working in the industry and how one can keep up with that oh that's a big one um so i started out doing film um mm -hmm. quickly well not quickly it, about 10 years <laughs> into my uh photography career you know, digital cameras came out a lot of a lot of photographers were freaked out spooked by that you know saying that their industry or our industry was going to end and everybody's going to have a camera and it's going to be you know mayhem well everybody has a camera now and there's still photography jobs um, you can still be a photographer you can still make money at being a photographer so i don't i i don't fear the technology i mean this kind of like uh, butts up against the new AI. I mean, everybody, a lot of chatter around artists are like, you know, AI is going to end our jobs or end our careers or, you know, take, take place of us. Mm -hmm. And I just don't see that happening. It's not, history hasn't shown that. It, it, it might show that it's another tool that you can use. You might become more, um, descriptive and more uh, able to tell a story and use that to actually help create or use AI as a tool in your own work. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard of photographers uploading all of their work and then using their own work as kind of basis for the, the, the stuff that they're, they're looking for that AI can generate. So it's okay. kind of just an extension. It's a tool that you can use. Um, as far as software or technology as far as software is concerned i mean I, there oh there's so many different software packages that we've used and then they just go away um i was talking about painting textures on godzilla we were using something called amazon studio uh, or amazon paint and it was this clunky 3d 
package, you know, it's like you're just rolling stuff around and you're trying to pay. It's, it was, it was horrible. I didn't like it. <laughs> and since then, I mean, you have now substance painter, you have, you know, uh, this, this elegant thing that it has smart textures and it is able to like help you procedurally build stuff. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's tremendous. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I struggle sometimes with trying to figure out is some is a new software package worth me investing my time in, in learning it. Mm. Um, yeah, I think there are certain times that you'd want to delve into a package, like like for me to, to pick up Substance or Unreal. Unreal is another another one of, of the day, but I'll I'll stick with Substance. Um, for me to sit down and learn Substance in and out as much as I do Maya or Houdini or Nuke, I don't think I have the time, you know, it's just, you got to pick and choose your battles and, and what you want to spend your time um, creating or uh, experiencing. Um, for me, it would be kind of a cursory glance at it and figure out what, what the idea behind substance is I would learn that and then I would deal with an expert or somebody who really knows the ins and outs of Substance Painter. And then I could communicate better with them and help them kind of like, kind of like I'm learning the AI technology of like how to interface with somebody even better only because I know a little bit more about the software process. Before we head out, could I have you plug in your social media so anybody can follow you and see what you're working on next? Sure, uh, MSF1313 at our, for Instagram. That's my, uh, my handle. Um, sure, check me out. Check out the, the stuff I'm working on. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining me today. Cool. I appreciate it so much and learning all about well, Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, hope that we can see you soon. Yep. I, I can't wait to see this aired.